I'm a systems architect at Hortonworks. And here I'm about to show you that how to create a time machine in, for the transactional data. So it's kind of a new concept, and uh, basically we are developing this concept in, in, a, in a very rapid fashion. Um, to understand this concept about it, I, I have a quick question about you, that how many of you understand the data warehousing? That's quite a few, so that's good. And how many use Mac Time Machine? Okay, so there are one or two people can understand the Mac Time Machine. So, um, so this concept is, is, is about, about changing the way how we develop the data, how we use the data warehousing. In order to understand the data first, so, so let me start this. Uh, um, we, we are hearing a lot about data lake, how to create data lake, and, and you know, you, you might have heard this, this term by now. And if, if you see the focus here is, 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 is on, when, when we see, see about the data lake, the most of the data is stored, not most, but all the valuable information is stored, stored in OLTP and ERP systems. And ERP and the CRMs are all the data which is the relational databases. So most of the data information is stored in the OLTP and ERP systems. And, and from there, the data goes to generally the enterprise data warehouse where we do all kind of staging and certain things, and we go to the BI and reporting tool. So this is a typical structure of, you see, in typical business intelligence tool as present. So our focus of this presentation is mostly we'll be focusing on, on these part, the how to do the data warehousing within Hadoop, and, and how can you leverage this platform to, to better analyze the data not doing the typical way of enterprise data warehousing. So this, it, 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 it different, different concepts of, of doing the data warehousing, this all together is just using the same model that yes, it's an OLTP data and repository and going to the BI reporting. So before we go to the concept of how we want to do things, first let's understand how things are doing as of now. So as of now, what's happening is that we have the source transaction system, which is like ERP, CRM, or maybe the PLM system, EAM system, or so many different different kind of, the banking might have 150 different kind of applications, which goes to the data warehouse. And from here, the data goes to a staging area. In the staging area, um, we do a lot of processing into the data. In the processing of the data, we do a lot of pre-calculation of the data, like, okay, pre-aggregation or certain thing like that, and, they and the data goes to, to the data mod or certain things. But even here, we lock down certain data, which we didn't want to move to the data mod or something, and we trash certain data. So if you, you can understand that there's a lot of valuable information we trash out. It just doesn't go anywhere. And finally goes to the data mod and the cubes. And, and we have the data marts at different kind of, like Ralph Kimball have this, uh, the star schema model, and there is a data vault model, there is a, a snowflake schema model. There are various kind of data warehousing model right now are there. And, and finally, because of doing the ad hoc queries and OL apps and the reporting tools, and it's all creative different kind of applications we want to build into enterprise data warehouse. So that's mostly, this is how it enterprise data warehouse model look like as of now. So let's understand a little bit a project life cycle of how enterprise data warehouse moves, uh, a typical project life cycle of that. The so first is to determine the list of the questions. Okay, I want to ask these, these, these questions, and, and you, you based on that, determine the list of questions. We design how our star schema will look like, how our data vault schema will look like, and certain things like that. And, and then we start collecting the data we from, and we write our tail end processes or, 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 or we start collecting the data from, from the source structure and then we develop the ETL process which is another time consuming process to write all the SQL queries and, and a lot of um, the, the PL SQL procedures or certain things if you're an Oracle and if you're SQL there. And then we execute those CTL process, of course, and, and, and then we ask questions from the list which we, we asked, thought earlier that these are the questions going to be asked. So in overall, we see that 
it's, it's a very time-consuming process. It can go from one month to six months, and even though there are a lot of errors and certain things in, in this process of the project life cycle. So overall, we do, because we have to do this because we use the dimension modeling to do the data warehousing in the OLAP models. So why we do this data, why we do uh, the OLAPs and the data cubes and other things? So let's understand, um, because it uses a small set of data. It uses a small set of data in, in the OLAP queries and something, and that's the biggest challenge we had over the period of five years ago, four years ago, how to store a large amount of data. So we used to use this OLAP kind of model to, because we, we were having a small data storage. And we get a better query performance when you can join multiple tables because we, in one table, data goes to the fact tables and dimension tables and other things like that. But we, and so we get the better query performance in that. And we simplify the query because we know what the question we're going to ask based on that. We design our schema. We basically have the simple queries over, over that. And uh, we can write the cubes and OLAPs, and basically we can do the in-memory aggregation. So OK, because we have a smaller data set, we can do in-memory, and you can do certain uh, processing faster in the OLAP queries. And then we can say, OK, these are the, the key performance indicator for, for for my um, data warehouse, then we can run, okay, we can find out what the key performance indicators are, and then we can, we can, find, we can generate those key performance indicators, and that's going to run over the future of the time when we design today, and then we can run period of, over the period of time, time again, and again, and again, and again. So this is the, the positives of, of the dimension modeling. But there is a limitations to it, and the limitation is that you can ask only the limited questions. So what you design your schema for, you can ask only those questions. You cannot ask any question in, in that data model. And, and I show you the project life cycle because it goes to that. It's this poor turnaround time because when you ask question which is not designed in, in that list of questions, it will take you more time to ask the same question again, different question. So you can ask only that amount of question or maybe similar question which is in that list when we design our schema. And, and most of the, a lot of data get lost because we, if we don't design our schema the way we want it, we get the data lost in, in, in the data warehousing. And another way is, is the big challenge is the change management. The person who is supporting the application understand their own source schema. They doesn't understand how the OLAP schema is designed and other stuff. So you need a different person to understand that, that schema or basically, the, you need a different kind of set of people to understand that. So it is a different kind of people you need it for, for one application, and another person you need it for another application to, to understand that. Or you have to bring the consultants in to design your data warehousing and other stuff. And, and the typical data warehouse these days are difficult to scale out, and that's one of the reasons is, is uh, the dimension modeling is, is there. And, and that is another crucial part of, of that, that you cannot develop the KPIs for the past record. Suppose you want to, you, you came up with a new key performance indicator for your business, and you want to design for the key performance for the past records, there's no way of, of running those, in, those queries for the past records you could develop for the future. So there are certain cases you can develop for past, if you know the data, the data is available, but certain cases, the data may not be available to run for past. So, so you again have to do the ETL to run for the past records, to run your key performance indicators. So, so these are the limitations of that. And, and now, before I, uh, I come to the point that how, to, how should we do it and, and what are the different ways of, of doing it, we need to understand the different economics of the data. So, so this is the cost of data generation. The cost of the data generation in the OLTP and the ERP system is the most high than, than any other systems because we in, invest millions and millions of dollars to invest those ERP system to, to uh, the CRM system to implement those, it gives a lot of money into that system and the data is locked down into those systems. But the amount of the data we generate is from, from, from the OLTP system is very tiny. It's, 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 it's hardly in terabyte range. It's mostly in the gigabyte range. So if you see any database for, for Oracle database or SQL Server database, it generally goes in gigabyte range. There's hardly few, few examples of the terabyte and if, if you see any DBA who manages the Oracle database and say, hey, I manage a terabyte of database. So, so this terabyte is, is a very large number for them. And, and other data sources, basically we have much more higher data, but this is about the data lake structure. And, and, and my focus here is, is right now, is just the, 
most organization is, is the OLTP system. The organization wealth is stored, is still in the OLTP system. It's, it's, these are the, the cool things we, you can do it, but let's understand the OLTP system because the data is stored is, a lot of data is stored in the OLTP system itself. So when this is expensive data, when this is so highly valuable data, the why we throw away certain information because if we don't know why to use it, the why we throw away certain information. That's another, is a, is a question I, I, I ask myself that why we throw away and then because we don't know how to do certain things, that's why we throw away, that doesn't make sense. So what I came up with with the, with the, with the concept of, of the time machine, um, it's, it's a different kind of concept of, of, of using this uh, transactional data in a different kind of paradigm when we have a lot of processing power of Hadoop and a lot of storage of Hadoop. So what we do is that we stop every, uh, when we have the ERP data and the store, what we want to do is we want to s store every transaction from the, from the source systems. From the ERP system, we want to grab every insert, update, delete from there, and, and we want to grab, basically, we want to put to the, to, the, to the Hadoop cluster. From Hadoop cluster, we want to run certain time machine algorithm, and, and then we want to move to the same schema as the sources, and then we want to run the reporting on that. And I'm going to do the detail of, of how we do that. So this is a basic high-level structure Then we, we need to, we, we, uh, how we design the, data, the time machine algorithm and, and the time machine approach of, of doing the data warehousing. So first thing is, the how do we capture the data? So, so we have some sort of set of data right now. So we, we can have an insert. Either, either there is an opportunity of insert, there is an opportunity of delete, uh, update, or there is an opportunity of delete. These are the only three transactions that can happen onto any database. So we need, what we need to do is we need to capture every insert, update, delete. And, and, and one of the ways of doing this capture of that, you can write a trigger onto the source schema of the source data structure, right? This is one of the way. Another way is, is um, if some, you know, there are a lot of people, you, you might be aware, may not want to write the triggers on that. You can write a, a periodic select queries. So you may not capture every insert, update, delete, but may capture the time shot of, okay, what has been changed over the period of last 15 minutes. So you can periodic select statement. You can write there, and you can, you can use that over the row stamp or time stamp if you have on, onto your data. Another is, is, the, is the more sophisticated way is using the Oracle archive logs. So you can use the archive logs and, and then you can get the, the team back with, without any performance impact. So if you have a source, key, source structure is Oracle, then you can use Oracle archive log and then put again into the Oracle database those archive logs on the real time basis and then from there you can write a trigger which will not affect any performance on the source data. So that's another mechanism is there. Uh, if you have a SQL Server, then you can use a SQL Server change data, change, uh, change data capture. There's a technology in SQL Server which allow you to give every insert update delete from the SQL Server. So there are various techniques you can use to get insert update deletes, and, and, and over the period of time, data warehousing people also use those kind of transaction data to get to their ETL models. Then how, and then how we store this data? Then comes to another point that, okay, so we have this data here. So whenever in, any insert happens, I want to capture its, its timestamp. Every time any insert happens, we, I want to capture its timestamp. And I, I want to just append to the same table which we have earlier. If any, um, any, the same way any update happens, I want to, I want to carry the, the, what exactly has been updated, the primary key of that, and, and the whole updated record of, of, with the timestamp. Another one is, is that anything happened over the, the primary key of the first statement and then the delete statement also with the timestamp. So every store information with date timestamp and every store every transaction with insert update delete flag. So you always have to carry those flags at the timestamp. This is it, um, the must feel. And I'm making assumption that Okay, so the primary, primary keys are, the way we, I developed is primary keys are stored for every table in a one XML file. 
So this used that XML file to, to grab that configuration. So that, that's why the assumption is that every table have a primary key. And, and that's stored in the XML file. And then we do the data transformation. And the data transformation goes from, like we have the insert, update, delete, a lot of transactions are there. And then it, we convert back to the source schema. We take the data and we convert back to the source schema as it was. And we use the secondary sort MapReduce algorithm to do that. And if you're not familiar with, with that, it's, it's just we, we take that every primary key, we sort with the primary key, with the date timestamp, and we get, okay, this is the latest data, and we put it back. So, so for every primary key, we're putting the latest time shot, and we're putting it to, to, the, to, to create the source schema. And then we are asking questions, basically, from the source schema. That, okay, these are the source schema, and then we ask the questions, here's that. Schema evolution. If your schema changes. Yeah. That, that, that's why, if, if your schema changes, you just keep, if you add a column into that schema, that, that should, that you should not worry about that because it's an additional column. If you change a schema in between, then Hive doesn't work very nicely with that. You have to, you have to do certain, because that means that this is a new table altogether. You, you reformat that table and you create a new table. So we have to create some sort of approach for that, that if, if that happens. If you just add a columns to that, that it will eventually keep on adding that column over, over that particular time. So after time X, you have a X column, and then you can have more columns to that. Yeah, you keep adding, because you're adding the records, right? So you keep adding those records there into the same team table, and if you have the column at the last stage, you can keep adding it, and they just you have to you have to just change the hive schema on that. But the, if the hive schema works very nicely, that if you, even though you don't have two last columns, you just get the null value for that. Oh, okay. So you are the default value then. Then you have to basically, because Hive or, or in MapReduce, you have to change the way it is, and then you have to grab the existing schema or existing data. You have to grab, you have to basically replicate that database again and, and put it back into, into the staging area and put it back. So, so it's this, there, there, is a, there may be a technique to doing it. Like you can, you can take the same data, you can add an additional column and then put it back. So that kind of thing it can be done. So, so basically by doing this, you don't have to learn a new schema. The schema is, is already there. There's a new, no point of, of learning a new schema. That, that is the big point here. But we're missing a different concept. And that, so we're missing a very important element here in the whole data warehousing. If this is that simple, then, then everybody would have done the same thing. But there's more to go. And, and, and then the thing is, is the time dimension. We do the data dimension modeling just because, because a lot of time, because we want to understand that how the, the records has been changed over the period of the past. So that is a very important thing we want to understand in the time machine, um, the, in, the, in, the, in the dimension modeling, that how things happen in the past. And that's where the time dimensions comes in. And we, we need a mechanism to see the history records, right? So you run anything from, from that schema, which is the outside schema, you run any query into that, you cannot see the past records over that. So we need a mechanism to see the history record, and, and we should be able to use SQL for, for, for doing that work. So, so that, that is something that we are looking for, that the solution which we develop is, is for that, the time concept and the time dimension concept for it. And, and we developed a, a basically a snapshot in the, in the hive. So we have this, when we select the, anything from a, any SQL query and we say, okay, give me the snapshot of that particular date time, what it does, it, it, it basically runs run the algorithm, time machine algorithm, which gets the data from the source system, uh, from, from the staging area and move to the, the results basically is coming from the staging area. So the same query is not running into the, the source schema, it's running onto that data first. It's, it's grab this and move 
it to the, the source, the different schema, it creates all together for on-demand basis, creates that schema, and then write the SQL queries on that. So when we say the snapshot, it basically creates the same thing, uh, the, 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 the model which is running right now for, for the, the latest snapshot, rather than running on the latest, it run on that particular time, it will create a new schema at that time, and then run the query on that. So, so this is a, a, a new Hive statement for snapshot. And another one snapshot, um, another one uh, which I came up is, 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 is that using a trend. So that is a very important that we want to run it again and again and again and again over the period of time. So the same thing, we have this, as we're running the SQL statement, like select color or, or from the table. So we, we have the inventory and we want to run that, okay, how this, um, how, what is the categories of, of the shirts and pants or whatever we want to see over, the, over our database. But we want to see that how this record has been changed over the past, you can just use the trend by number, trend by statement, and you can run the same query and you can go over the period of year, month, week, or, or, or days, and you can see over the period of the past that how this record has been changed by using just the trend by statement. So this becomes important to, to do that analysis. And those two statements, basically we use, uh, we extended the hive using, um, it generates the MapReduce and then extend the hive further. So we are not, uh, it's not part of the, the Apache hive yet, we, we want to, to understand how the response of means how many people you people want to use this, and it, because it's 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 using the two different schemas, so so it's not at the part of Hive, but we have a source code which can if you use the same schema and, and configure it in the XML file, which can be go over the period of past records and and you can see the recorded records. So, what is the advantage of of doing this? The advantage of using that is that you can ask any question at any point of time. Uh, there's no limitation of, of the dimension modeling. When, if you have a source data, you have the same data structure, you understand that you can ask questions. If you have to go to the past, you can go to the past. So you have the complete 360 view of the data, how things happen, and you can ask any question. Um, another big point of the change management part is that you have, don't have to learn any new schema. Uh, going to the dimension modeling, you have to learn a new schema model all the time. This one doesn't give you any you, you use the same series schema as you're using it. And KPIs can be generated for the past. So you have the key performance indicator which is running over, running over the trend and then running the trend and looking at the trend. Now you, you came up with the new key performance indicator, oh, okay, I want to see that how uh, my maintenance records, how my maintenance supervisor is doing over the period of time. You come up with the key performance indicator for that. And then the same query which you, are, you want to run every day, you can run over the period of time when you started the time machine, and then you can see the records there. And very quick turnaround, because you have those, right now you see the project life cycle of the ETL model, which you have to design the question, you have to understand, you are designing the new schema. Here, you, you, it, the, the, the SQL may be complex. That's, that's what it can be. And you, you, rather than writing a graphical user interface, you may have to have rely on your, on your technical staff a little bit to write a complex SQL statement. But it's, it's just one or two day worth of time. You can ask any question about the data set because no ETL part is happening here. You can ask, the SQL time may take, rather than one minute, might take six minutes or eight minutes or 10 minutes, but it's, it's still a very quick turnaround because your, your questions are answered right there and you don't have to ske learn in schemas and other stuff. And, in the ETL process, there's a lot of errors are happening because you're grabbing the data, you're doing the pre-calculation and certain things. Now, because this, everything is automatic from, from source to, the, to, the, to that, uh, if, you're, if you're one process is, is fine, you test this process and then everything else is automatic, so there's no chances of errors in the ETL process. If there's chances of error this in, the, in the base algorithm, we will fix it and that's the whole thing. The, there's only one algorithm which, which runs, so there's two, one or two, three algorithms which runs, then there is a have to be, have to be problem in the, in the base technology, not in the ETL process, which is the problematic area. Another thing is the peace of mind that no data is getting lost, is, is that you have all the data, you can run any time, and, and you have that availability of, of the data every time. I understand that you have a one terabyte of data, you are storing a lot of insert of data deletes, it, it creates a huge amount of record, that's why we, I showed the first slide that we, this, the amount of value we created is this much and the data is generated this much. So now we are storing every data, so we, maybe the data may be larger, 
but it's still the value which this data contains is much more higher than any other data which the ERP system have, and this is the only data we're going to store. Uh, so we, we have to understand that. So how do we deploy this? So, so what is the, how long it takes the deployment and, and, and the deployment cycle, how does it goes? So, so first we have to buy the infrastructure, install the infrastructure, do this certain things, and we start putting the triggers or whatever things we need to do it, whether we use the SQL Server logs or whether we use the, use the Oracle Archive logs or, or, or the SQL queries, whatever we do it, we start collecting the data. We, st we put the infrastructure Hadoop in installation there, we start the collecting the data, and we start storing the data into that format. And that's it. That's the part is done of that. So, so after that, you start asking the question, what the question is there, and, and, and after that, you develop your queries. That's, that's, that's the part of that. You, you ask question, you develop the queries, and, and you see the results right there. It's, it may take five minutes because it's a hive queries. It may take 10 minutes. It depends upon the, the performance and the scale of the data. But eventually, you, you just see the results right there, and you improve your business processes further. You, you, you just, uh, because you, you want to see the results, you improve the business processes, and then you, de you develop more curiosity, you develop more curiosity, and you ask questions again. So it's, it's, a, it's the, there's no ETL process, there's nothing. The only using those two different SQL statements, you have the view of, of the time series, of the data, and you have the source schema, which you're using it, and you can develop the whole process. So, so, so this what is, is this about? So I open for questions now, I have a lot of time. Okay, so, so right now we use the Hive hook. Hive hook. So using the Hive hook, we have a secondary sort MapReduce algorithm. So if you use a secondary sort MapReduce algorithm, which gives the time shot of that, and using Hive hook, we are able to put those MapReduce on top of Hive queries and use those Hive hook to, to develop the time series data, and then we can develop that queries by running the time series, and then we develop the query on that. So the Hive hook is the where we, we write our own MapReduce and then put it the configuration XML file for all the primary keys for all the tables. That's the only information we need. That what are the tables are there and what are the primary keys, and that's it. And then use the Hive hook to, to design the whole things. Uh, okay, so. For, for that, what I have envisioned that probably what is going to happen that because we have a lot of snapshot views, you can just, uh, uh, I have like a snapshot underscore kind of thing is there which when we develop, when we write those data. So we can periodically erase those data over the whatever is lost for a certain time or certain thing like that. So you. Huh? Right now, I don't have any automatic processing for deleting the snapshot views. So right now, it's just a. Uh, uh, right now, it's in. Uh, I've developed everything. It's it's not on GitHub, but I can put on GitHub soon. But it's it's. I I was testing it with uh, with the uh, with ten node cluster with multi million records and everything is, is good, looking good. So we can put it on the GitHub and we'll start using. Um, to do that.
I, I thought about that a lot about this. The, 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 you know, there's the advantage of the dimension modeling that you can produce for that. The only limitation for that is that I, I say that it's, it's not going to go away with the dimension modeling. The data warehouse is already existing. You want to use that thing. This is okay because Hadoop cluster is very cheap, right? You can put a 100 node cluster or maybe a 10 node cluster and they start collecting the data there. There's no cost to this. And then you come up with the question which you're not able to answer from your from dimension modeling questions. Then you can ask here, right? So, so that's why I, I show in this slide somewhere that if I go back to. In the 12 node cluster, how much data you want to store? Forty minutes. So, but that, that's a using the that's using the power of Hadoop. That's using the power of Hadoop, right? That's using even the within dimension modeling, the queries are taking more time, and then you can process that. That's a different thing. But what I, but he's saying that if you don't do dimension modeling, the, you, the users are not interactive, right? So what, the, what this thing is supposed to do is that you already have existing data mart, you already have existing data warehouse, and and people might, some of the people might be happy about it, some of the people might be frustrated about it that this it doesn't work. I don't get the answers from the questions I want to ask. This about this gives you an additional feature. That's why I say we always say the data lake is is not change, going to change your data warehouse. It complements that, it extends that. So by using that, you can ask more questions which are not able to ask these questions from, uh, the, from, the, from, from the dimension modeling data warehouse. You ask whatever you're doing, you, you cannot do in memory. You cannot do plus minus like uh, um, you use like the pre-aggregated, you cannot build the cubes on that and you can do the plus, plus, plus things. For those are the definitive set of questions which you want to ask. But there are a lot of questions which you want to ask. But even, even though you don't dare to ask most of the time, executives don't dare to ask because they don't, they know they're not going to get the answers here. But now here with surety there that yes, I can get the answer. We may, may have to write a complex SQL statement and that's it. And, 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 and most of the time, frankly speaking, that SQL statement may not be that, uh, that complex. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put this into the, uh, uh, the Hive server too so that every other, uh, Every, right now, we use the Hive hook, which runs as a plain vanilla Java statement, so you have to write the Java query. We're trying to move this to uh, Hive Server 2 so that you can use any tool which develops the SQL queries. So which can develop the SQL queries, the only thing, okay, you develop the SQL query using the tool and then write a little bit trend by or snapshot, and then you can grab the data there, and you can modify your extensions and then see the time series views. So what you're saying that, okay, we have two different ERP system, all are generating the purchase order data. Now, when you're doing this, you are aggregating all three different kind of purchase order system and they're putting into the one, one common platform, right? Uh, the answer for that is that um, what you can do is that you can write whatever the question you have in, in, in one query and then another system, another system, because in Data Lake you have all the systems there. And then, you, and, and then you can write a query and then union it and then you can see it. So, so it's just a SQL query. It may be a complex because you have to write a unions to it, but no ETLs, no, uh, no worrying about, okay, where the, my data warehouse is coming, what is exactly is doing. You ask your question, here is the answer is available right there. Maybe take five, 10 minutes to get the answers, but answer is available. Any other questions?
Thank you. Thank you so much.